Just you if it gets dark They don't just go and set up camp in the park The policeman will lock them up in the car Hey Donna, don't wanna be so the housing rally is today at Virginia Square Hey, Keisha, how's it going? Hi, bro. I'm just in a cab. I'm sorry I'm late. No worries. No worries. I'm just rolling up. It's rolling not up as shortly easy here. as everyone thinks. You take for granted all of the smallest things. So what does a homeless person do if they need a drink? Well, what do you think? What do the homeless do if they need to shit? To go into a store, you gotta pay for it. To hold it in can make you really sick. So what do the homeless do? Just get used to it. Is that fair to expect? Another one in Toronto. He is a greeting in our Blackfoot language. And Nitanaku Gyayu, I've just said my name is Bear. Uh, that was my first name that was given to me by my uncle Willie Big Bull, who resides from the Treaty 7 area of the Blackfoot Confederacy. I also am from the West Coast here, the Kwakwakiwa people who reside from Campbell River North, right up to the uh, Bella Bella area. Go turn it up. So if you've ever been into those areas, then you've been into my home territories, and I'd just like to say thank you. I wanted to tell you that um, I brought some tobacco today. Um, I brought some tobacco to pay the land. Before I even stood up here, I went around to the four corners and uh, there's some tobacco there if you want to pay the land. We pay the land when we stand on, the, on here and we do our work. And paying the land is about honoring the ancestors that each and every one of you bring. Each and every one of you have ancestors, even though you may not have a land base or a language or you may not know who your people are. Each and every one of you bring your ancestors with you, your grandparents, your parents, your aunties, your uncles, those who have gone before you. They're always with you. Never doubt that for a second. This is called Spirit Square. It's not called Centennial Square. That is the colonized name. This is Spirit Square. So what I did is I paid the earth to honor all the spirits for the unceded territory that we're on today. So with that, I'd just like to give my gratitude to each and every one of you for being here today. There's a lot that we have to talk about. I brought some notes with me, which I usually don't do, but I felt it was really important to highlight the connections that we have. You know, we walk on paths and we think we're the only ones walking on those paths. But if you take the time to look ahead of you or behind you, you're going to see somebody has been there. Somebody's been there before you and somebody will be there after you, always. Never forget that. So if you're doing this work and you feel like you are unloved, uncared for, unheard, that is so far from the truth because it takes a very strong person to speak up. More importantly, it takes a strong person to show up with no agenda. So I um, accept the absolute gratitude and gratefulness with you here today. Uh, I have been in touch with individuals from the downtown east side, which is one of my communities. I spent my early years while I was in care as a 60 scooper on the streets of Hastings uh, from about the age of 15 until I aged out. And then I returned here to Victoria, HIV positive, and I became the first woman in Canada to publicly disclose my HIV status. So I traveled to all of the communities, all the reserves across Canada. And uh, you know, if there's one place
place that you can see the have and have nots of housing is when you go on reserve. You go to a community. And how many reserves do we have around Victoria? Does anybody know? Has anybody been there? Yes, you got seven. Seven yeah. First Nations communities right around Victoria. And if you have not been there, you have completely missed out on the point of being in Victoria. Because it's much more than the Empress Hotel. It's much more than our legislature. Exactly. Those have been put up by the colonizers. And we are just grassroots people. We watch these buildings being extracted as we watch our homes being destroyed. Our support systems being completely broken up. The saddest thing for me was watching the tent city community yeah. being dismantled. That's right. With the city, with the police, and yes, with yeah. public security. It was and horrible. And now we're all those people. They're all disconnected. They're families. They're taking care of one another. Now, seniors are also another issue that we need to bring up because what we do with our elders is we put them in these for-profit homes called... What are they called? Old folks homes? Yeah, senior care. Senior care homes. homes. Yes. Woo, that just gives me the willies. I'm 51, so I'm going to be a senior soon. And uh, the last place I'm going to be is in one of those seniors homes. But more importantly, what I want to bring up is the issue of assisted dying. Because it's a lot cheaper to kill a person with, then let them live with dignity and affordable housing. So if life is becoming too challenging, if people are feeling like they're a burden on their family, it's $2,300 to kill somebody legally than to support them to live. Shame. This is shameful, and this is a practice our government is bringing in wholeheartedly, island health care. So... You, we need to keep an eye out on our elders and people who are suffering. In the downtown east side, Pivot Legal Society, Van Du, and university students on grassroots are all working as a unified voice called Let's Speak Up. And what they're doing is they're interviewing and filming community members to tell their own stories and leadership. What a better way than to have somebody's personal story. I have a thing with bees. That reaches somebody. Their rally cry is, our homes can't wait. That's right. Just think about that for a minute. Our homes can't wait. So for those of you that don't have a home, that means you don't have a home. And you'll be waiting for a long time. If you're in an existing place that isn't safe, then the chances of you getting out of that place is very limited because there are only so many single room occupancies and supported housing that people can be sh shifted around and shuffled through the system in. So in Vancouver, the city has yet to define what the definition of tenant rate policies are. So this group is getting together and they are going really? to define no, what tenant away. rate policies are. So let's speak up when you hear shows. that and yeah. our homes can't wait, wait. That is the rally cry from the downtown east side right now. And I believe we do have a sister from Vancouver. I'm also a, uh, I have been a member and an ally of Leo for a long time. Um, Kim and I do very different work. My work is in health, specifically frontline work with HIV and AIDS prevention, um, specifically around harm reduction. And housing to me has become unfortunately um, a secondary issue, even though I've been homeless many times with my children in Victoria. So I've moved here from Alberta and because I didn't have money to feed my kids, I was told to take them to a shelter. Even though I had a roof over my head and all I needed was a bit of food. They said, well, you've got a roof over your head, take your kids to a shelter and they'll be fed. And no, I'm not taking my kids to a shelter to be food. I'll go out and dumpster dive to do that. Hey. Anyways, 
That's a little bit about me. My name is Gayu, otherwise my name is Keisha uh, Larkin. I'm from the Pigani Nation, and I'm also from the Kwakwakwa people. And I'd just like to say thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of my own experience and share some words with you. I'll be in touch with the uh, community in the downtown east side over the next little while through Zoom as well as through Kim. So I look forward to more community spaces like this where we can speak openly about our concerns. Language, Keisha. Can everyone just give her the warmest thank you in a cloud? Woo -hoo! Keisha's been representing and opening up our rallies, and it's the, I think the first one that she's been able to come and do it in person, she's been doing it on the phone. And so the next person is going to be on the phone, and if everyone can help me welcome Ida Manuel, uh, and please help me pronounce Sepequa Territory. Sort of slapped me 
senseless. I was like, whoa, I never thought of it like that. Yeah, and so I think about it. You know, my dad, he had, George Manuel, he had, you know, he had the experience of his grandparents to protect him out of the system as long as they could until, you know, he was found out and, and brought into the, carted into the, or what are they, they use, my partner also likes to point out the cattle trucks. And, and I also like to bring, um, to tie together the cattle trucks. It was quite a vision to see what looked like one of those cattle trucks coming up to um, when you go to the Carnegie Outreach and I don't know what that building is there right above their office but they were emptying out all the beds and all the belongings of someone we were, we were you know concerned wondering what was what was happening and then that's what they were using was a truck that looked like that was um, a cattle truck and it was quite a vision to see it get filled up with people's belongings and we were wondering what happened to those people what led me here was I was living in a Vancouver Native Housing Society and I got some things to say about that too, but I'll just go and stick to <laughs> describing what happened so I don't go off on. Is, uh, my daughter got pushed at a unit inspection, uh, I'd say back around September, and um, it, it, it resulted in her falling down the stairs. And, you know, moments before that, my daughter was like high, shrill voice and said, Mom, get in here, get in here now. And I I was resting outside. That's how stressful that place became for me. I couldn't even sleep in there. I was on edge and yeah, that happened. And the only, um, so, like the only communications I, I got after that happened, oh, oh, I skipped over her, her coworker seemed trained to only bring his camera out when we got upset. And we got upset because he just, she just finished pushing my kid down the stairs. So, but of course we're upset. Um, but, uh, you know, I had to advocate very strongly. I had to bring in like, uh, I think I had seven in total in support in the meeting with me, but two on the phone and five in the room. Yeah. I think that was including myself, so four in the room. And um, and then the two workers. So anyway, um, yeah, the only, the only communications I received from them in following the incident was from the abuser herself. And I just, was at a loss and, and I, I've been diagnosed with, well, you know, I hate the labels, but you know, I, I've been diagnosed, understand, understandably so, with CPTSD. Yeah, I don't know if you're all um, familiar with that. It's, you know, ongoing trauma and, and it's not finished yet. You know, like it's, it still implies that it's over and I'm, I'm recovering from some traumas that have happened in my past. It's not past, it's not, um, you know, like my niece Connell who points out, the Indian wars are not over. Yes. And I understand it. And, and when I was first getting started with, with, with coming forward and speaking out, I, I was told this is a spiritual, this is a spiritual war, like you, you really, you gotta come hard and strong, you know, you gotta be ready. And, and I didn't know, really, I couldn't put those, to, to all that together until, you know, now to experience what I have been going through. Um, in a sense, I felt for me to be out of there, but, um, you know, because I did start feeling like I, I did have some health problems that were really uh, random and and odd. Uh, it kept me to my bed and, and, and unable to, like, walk and do a lot of things for myself for almost a year. Two separate incidences, incidents happened where my health, so I can understand now after coming through some of it and how, you know, protection in the sense of what some people think is like four walls around them you know like a shelter yeah. um, is not no 
lot. And, and now for me, I have a wider understanding of how I must prepare and protection for ourselves and my family and my bundle. And um, yeah, it's been quite a learning experience and, and learning who I can, you know, trust and who I can have near me or who's really helping me or who's really helping me for the right reason, you know, and so on and so on. And I shouldn't have to be on edge with all of this, but I shouldn't have to be carrying this as an Indigenous woman, you know. With Canada flaunting reconciliation, I just finished taking a photo of an event that they advertised on the board over here for tomorrow. And I didn't even know anything about it. And you know who's funding it? The government of Canada. And so, um, yeah, the, what, why they've been leading me is I've had to stand strong on my Indigenous rights and um and for 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 camping here and um yeah sorry go i'll go back to like um the incident uh, i haven't received any support and what i did do a lot of research was i found out that there is a lot of stuff that's supposed to be support for the tenants and nobody ever did reach out not even now and yeah, so I found that out. Somebody told me to research that uh, um, how many people are underneath the title if you search Vancouver Native Housing Society on the LinkedIn um, uh, app or whatever. But, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, it was to say all these people are receiving all these funds, right? And so when I did have a meeting with the uh, one meeting I went in was out in October. Or maybe the end of September. I went into the office in Vancouver Native Housing Society, and and you know they just had a lot of excuses. And one of my questions that they couldn't really answer to is why then, if you're starting to, what I found out in this process is that you're not serving just natives anymore. And they didn't deny it, but they actually got annoyed that I like acting like you know I'm just causing trouble here where there's none to be had and I said well what's the point of having the natives the aboriginal on the title anymore and they just looked blank like they weren't expecting that question and I, I said well what, why is it I understand that you can get your hands into pockets of funding that are made for natives exactly what these guys are doing with this event tomorrow they, they splash reconciliation on it. They splash indigenous on it. And and this is what's happening. This is the reality. And when they stay and they put in the budget, they're spending all this on reconciliation. They're spending all this on, on natives. Um, I just, there's so much awareness that needs to be raised. I could sit here probably talking all day about it. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you need to take a break. I don't know if I've gone over my time. No, no, it's good. I, I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. For sure. Right on. Like, thank you so much, Ida, for sharing. Like, really, we really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's, it's a gift, and, and that's part of what Keisha talked about earlier, is that we're trying to, you know, connect and network with each other across the water, across, you know, uh, so-called Canada in, uh, you know, uh, illegally settled in all these indigenous territories. And a lot of settlers like myself are allies. And what's the other word, Keisha? There's ally and there's accomplice. So there's a lot of people who understand what that means now and things are changing. And I'd like to hear any, any thoughts you have, like uh, we're, we're, we've been talking about community-based security culture um, and the street has a basic understanding of that and indigenous sovereign people still have a basic understanding of it. I, I know like your family have taught me a lot about what sovereignty means and uh, what, what protocol means. You and the Stoughton have taught me as well. And so a lot of us are, are totally willing to fall under the leadership of indigenous within their own territories. And, and, and so in the meantime, we have a daily situation where you know abortion uh, laws are being challenged, the right wing is trying to rise and all these things. And police state on unhoused is bringing a lot of tension to the unhoused, like it's just a lot of pressure and you brought up complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So do you have any like any ideas or thoughts about 
about that, you know, sort of indigenous-led community security culture and how we can do it in the cities? No worries, you're clear as day. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that happened. And the only, um, so, like, the only communications I, I got after that happened, oh, oh, I skipped over her. Her coworker seemed trained to only bring his camera out when they got upset. And we got upset because he just, she just finished pushing my kid down the stairs. Yeah. So, but of course we're upset. Um, but, you know, I had to advocate very strongly. I had to bring in, like, um, I think I had seven in total in support in the meeting with me, but two on the phone and five in the room. Right on. I think that was including myself, so four in the room. And, um, and then the two workers. So, anyway, um, yeah, the only, the only communications I received from them in following the incident was from the abuser herself and oh. I just was at a loss and, and I, I've been diagnosed with, well, you know, I hate the labels, but you know, I, I've been diagnosed understand, uh, understandably so with CPTSD. Yeah, me too. I don't know if you're all um, familiar with that. It's, you know, ongoing trauma and, and it's not finished yet. You know, like it's... It still implies that it's over and I'm I'm recovering from some traumas that have happened in my past. It's not past, it's not, um, you know, like my niece kind of always points out, the Indian wars are not over. Yeah. And I understand it and, and when I was first getting started with, with, with coming forward and speaking out I I was told this is a spiritual this is a spiritual war like you you really you gotta come hard and strong you know you gotta be ready and yeah. and I didn't know really I couldn't put those to, to all that together until yeah. you know now to experience what I have been going through yeah um in a sense I felt for me to be out of there but um you know because it did start feeling like I, I, I did have some health problems that were really um random and and odd you know it kept me to my bed and 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 unable to like walk and do a lot of things for myself for almost a year two separate incidences incidents happened where my health so i can understand now after coming through some of it and how you know protection in the sense of what some people think is like four walls around them you know like a shelter yeah um, is not 
Um, and now for me, I have a wider understanding of how I must prepare and protection for ourselves and my family and my bundle. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's been quite a learning experience and, and learning who I can, you know, trust and who I can have near me or who's really helping me or who's really helping me for the right reason, you know, and so on and so on. Yeah. And I shouldn't have to be on edge with all of this and I shouldn't have to be carrying this as an Indigenous woman, you know. With Canada flaunting reconciliation, I just finished taking a photo of an event that they advertised on the board over here for tomorrow. And I never even know anything about it. And you know who's funding it? Government of Canada. Why they've been leading me is I've had to stand strong on my Indigenous rights. Yep. And, um, and for 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 camping here and um yeah sorry go i'll go back to like um the incident uh, i haven't received any support and what i did do a lot of research was i found out that there is a lot of staff that's supposed to be support for the tenants and nobody ever did reach out not even now and yeah so i found that out somebody told me to research that uh, uh how many people are underneath the title if you search by Cougar Native Housing Society on the LinkedIn um, uh, app or whatever. Okay. But, uh, so, you know, it was to say all these people are receiving all these funds, right? And so when I did have a meeting with the uh, one meeting I went in was at a over or maybe the end of September. I went into the office in Vancouver Native Housing Society and and you know they just had a lot of excuses and one of my questions that they couldn't really answer to is why then if you're starting to what I found out in this process is that you're not serving just natives anymore. And they didn't deny it but they actually got annoyed that I like acting like you know I'm just causing trouble here where there's none to be had and I said well what's the point of having the natives the aboriginal on the title anymore and they just looked blank like they weren't expecting that question so weird I, I said well why why is it I understand that you can get your hands into pockets of funding mm. that are made for natives exactly what these guys are doing with this event tomorrow yeah. They, they splash reconciliation on it. They splash indigenous on it. And and this is what's happening. This is the reality. And when they stay and they put in the budget, they're spending all this on reconciliation, they're spending all this on, on natives. Yeah. Um, I just, there's so much awareness that needs to be raised. I could sit here probably talking all day. <laughs> you should talk about earlier is that we're trying to, you know, connect and network with each other across the water, across, you know, uh, so-called Canada and, uh, you know, uh, illegally settled in all these indigenous territories. And a lot of settlers like myself are allies. And what's the other word, Keisha? There's ally and there's accomplice. So there's a lot of people who understand what that means now and things are changing. And I'd like to hear any, any thoughts you have, like uh, we're, we're, we've been talking about community-based security culture um, and the street has a basic understanding of that and indigenous sovereign people still have a basic understanding of it. I, I know that, like your family have taught me a lot about what sovereignty means and uh, what, what protocol means. You and the Stoughton have taught me as well. And so a lot of us are, are totally willing to fall under the leadership of indigenous within their own territories. And, and, and so in the meantime, we have a daily situation where, you know, abortion uh, laws are being challenged, the right wing is trying to rise and all these things, and police state on unhoused is bringing a lot of tension to the unhoused, like it's just a lot of pressure and you brought up complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So do you have any like any ideas or thoughts about about that, you know, sort of indigenous-led community security culture and how we can do it in the cities? Well, yeah, I mean, I can understand the, the um, turnover or, or whatnot, the wording for um, the community's faces changing, you know, um, because of 
because of the fentanyl crisis, because of the missing and the murdered. Um, I can understand that, that the, um, and, it's, and the stress of it all is difficult to maintain the same people's right? So that's one thing that I'll point out and I can understand is that, but it's also important um, to be in the thinking of this community structure to be um, switching everybody out so everybody gets the experience, including the young people, but um, and, and, and involving the, the elders as well because of the experience, right? Everybody has something to say, and the, and the mothers, the life givers, and you think about the aunties and the, and the uncles have their role, and, and we have to we have to um, follow in the footsteps of our ancestors more now than ever. And that, and that um, foundation is where I stem my beliefs. Like, thank you so much, Ida, for sharing. Like, really, we really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's, it's a gift, and, and that's part of what Keisha talked about earlier. It goes on that uh, they're going to... They're gonna have to get bigger, or they're gonna they're gonna be bigger, bigger just naturally. Because as, as I think about what we're going through, I can only imagine what the next generations are gonna go through. Can you get some photos on your phone? Uh, you know, things keep up the same way. We don't change things right now. There's gonna be a lot more homelessness, and a lot more of this, and I think these these crowds are gonna inevitably get get bigger. But you know, besides that, I think that we can all expand by tweeting about this, by telling our friends about this. You know, in the six degrees of separation, I think that we can all let six people know this and maybe, you know, get the impact going, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just want to talk a bit about SOS, so what we're, what we're doing right now. SOS was started, I uh, call it the Street Outreach Society. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we were started about is uh, basically the gap in services. Uh, there's no, there's, there's one, one group that has a solid, the peer support, which is solid, you know? And Saul's got it right, right? But um, it's just for, for, for the housing, for the unhoused community, we find that the, the, even though the opioid crisis and the unhoused community uh, are hand in hand, they're two separate issues at the same time, right? So we really needed to, to, to take care of, have, have, have someone take care of um, the unhoused and focus on that. Because Saul is busy right now uh, with you know the opioid crisis and also how to go tense and, and whatnot and, 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 and all that. Right? It's so true. You guys are like o like overloaded, right? So we just decided to form as trying to try to basically for us for us, you know, uh, yeah, just basically just trying to start grassroots organizing, which scares the shit out of the city. I can't do that. Um, but basically, because of the lack of the, the lack of services, like there's you know they were saying they were housing all these people and everything, uh, you know, and. They're actually just, they're putting them in, into assisted funeral homes, basically, or assisted suicide homes, I think that was what they are. Oh, good um, term. You know, there's no one standing up for those people's rights. So that's why we kind of started. You know, there's no, no one standing up for for our rights. No one calling a bylaw. We have to advocate for ourselves because no one is doing it for us. That's right. Right, that's what, that, that's, that's what it's come down to. We have to do it ourselves. You know, we're doing it unfunded. We're doing it all volunteer. Uh, we got one volunteer that's going around, running around. He's, he's doing uh, relief tents, and you know he goes around with a bike in a trailer and sets up a tarp and brings coffee and you know juice and stuff like that for people who are getting displaced. And he's unhoused himself. Okay, awesome. this is, so this is this is like the heart that is, this is taking. That's right? awesome. Uh, this is the initiative that, that people are feeling and, and 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 the need to do this is just to get up and get it done. So that's what SOS is. It's basically just a group of our own peers to just decide to, to do what they can to help one another out, whether that be handing out supplies, whether that be handing out safe supply, whether that be just listening to your brother or sister or talking to someone who needs an ear, um, finding the supports they need through your resources or, or networking, just stuff like that. And it's just a matter of doing it on behalf of, of basically goodwill, honestly. This is just a kind of like a pay it forward kind of thing, movement, right? You know what I mean? So. Anybody can kind of be a member of, uh, you know, the Street Outreach Society as long as, as, as you have in one mind is, is to empower the street community. And that's basically what our mission statement is, to empower the street community. Um, I hope this housing situation obviously gets, gets better and, and starts to change, but I, I have a, a you know, bad feeling that it's not going to. 
I think that we made, need to make a lot of noise, noise before they even start to, 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 to recognize that there is a housing crisis. They, they, don't, they don't even want to admit that there is a housing crisis right now, right? That's so, right. That's on us. Is, I mean, when you look around, you can't help but not see it. I don't know what, what, what the politicians need, you know, as far as uh, a wake-up call. What more do they need? I mean, six years in an opioid crisis. We had two years, you know, in, 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 a, in a little pandemic, and we got that cleaned up. You know, on the rise again, and then six years for an opioid crisis. Sorry, guys. Get one. Oh yeah, you got, you got, you got. We have the, the, the means keep to solve these problems. It's just a lack of political will. You know, we really do have the means to solve the problems. It's just these guys don't want to. Right, so. I mean, and we just got to keep putting pressure on these guys. You know, we're thinking possibly SOS setting up an up an encampment down here, just you know, with the cat out of the bag, right? Yeah. So yeah, just having our own, our own kind of basically set a protest. Woo! Absolutely, absolutely. You're not going one of these, don't you know, you guys? So. Yeah, absolutely. And just basically every Thursday night, we'll just come down here and yell at the city hall until they start getting it. You know, absolutely, absolutely. I I just want to thank you, Kim, for for letting me come out here and speak. Thank you guys for for giving me the opportunity to do this. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, support SOS and uh, housing is human right. Right on, man. That was awesome. Seriously, that was awesome. I just want to uh, thank you, Shay. That was awesome, and uh, we'll we'll help get the word out and and help build some support for you around that. Bunny's gonna go first, and she's uh, Bunny's an awesome active member of the Anarchists of Vancouver Island, and uh, I'm gonna just clean the mic for them. Who's uh, I'm gonna follow protocol. Cool. Okay. So. Lots to talk today. It was very nice. I love the information. I love hearing people. You know, it's amazing. Uh, shout out to Tony. He's a good dog. I like him. <laughs> He's a little the guy. But um, yeah, just a little introduction. Hi, my name's Bunny. Um, sorry, I had thoughts in my head for words, but then it's the okay. thoughts disappeared in my head, and now I'm here. Take a breath. Um. <sighs> So yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. So just to talk about myself a bit, not to, you know, but I, I, I have complex PTSD I, um, due to intergenerational trauma, due to residential schools, I'm third out. Um, my great grandmother was in one. Um, luckily my rest of the next few generations were lucky enough to not have to deal with that. But, um, yeah, and it's it's just ridiculous what's happening with the housing and the opioid cri crisis. And the other day, my, my friend, um, I'm not going to say their name, but they overdosed on mushrooms. And, it, you know, if you're, if you're an active, like, if you know anything about drugs, you can't overdose on mushrooms. They were laced with opioids. And that's like, that's like, that's like really hard from what I was told. Like, what, what's the point? So I had to give them three naloxone, and we sent them to Pez. Luckily, they were discharged the same night, two hours after, so they weren't stuck in Pez, thank God. But, and they begged them not to tell their parents, because their parents threatened to kick them out if they overdosed again, for something that isn't their fault. That's sad. <laughs> but yeah, so that's just a little thing, and then... You know, I do, when, when it was really cold outside, I, what I was doing is I was handing out hot chocolate to the unhoused community up on Pandora, and just wherever I could. It was really nice, actually. Um, everyone's super sweet, everyone, you know, it's really great. Recently, I, um, I met this guy over by the Dollarama. His name's Moondog, he's super sweet. Um, we, talked, we talked a lot, luckily he found housing now, so I'm super happy for him about that. And I don't see him as often, but, you know, that's okay. No, people go in and out of life, and that's okay right now. <laughs> that's life. Um, what the government do is doing is like practically well, and is it practically? It is bullshit. Like they're acting, they're just being ignorant. They're like, okay, we have an opioid crisis. Don't see. Oh, COVID. Two years, we can fix that, but not the opioid crisis. Like you know, like Shay said, and then the housing crisis. Oh, this has been going on for like late, literally ever. Like, like here, everywhere. Like, there's all like unhoused people have like, and they just put a blind eye to it because you know they still pay taxes when they buy food. 
or when they buy necessities, like their taxpayers, like why turn a blind eye? Um, yeah, and I'm currently, see, I, I'm living in two places right now. I'm currently living in a group home up, uh, up, uh, by, like, Simmons and Cook, and then the other half of the Hey, Patricia, I know you have to go. You still oh, there? I'm not, I'm to go back there okay, good, just hang up when you have to, because this is awesome that you're still here. invited someone into the house that I'm not really comfortable with, oh, yeah, no, and it's kind of like, oh, what's up? I'm very happy to be a part of this. But, and I'm yeah. very grateful to you, Tim. Right on, I'm thanks. looking for housing. I'm constantly looking for housing. Like, and like, I reach out, like, because I'm aging out soon, so like, I gotta I got get on this. Like, I can't live with my mom forever. I gotta get a job. I can't do work. Like, it's too hard for me. I can't go to school. It's just too debilitating, like, it, uh, yeah. So it's hard enough to find a job without high school degree. It's hard enough to find a job, period. It's hard enough to find basic income, period. It's hard enough to find housing, period. It should, none of that should have had existed. It, you should have basic income, you should have housing, you should have job, like, like, you know, like, if you can. But like, you know, people should, we should be able to have these. Like, I've been, for the last couple of weeks, I, like, I, I do traveling merchanting, so I push around this little cart and I sell art stuff because I like art and I want to make a living off of it. But recently I've slowed down because I, a couple times by law has been like, what are you doing? No, don't do that. And I'm like, leave me be, man. Just let me live. But, so I've been living, in, living off some mutual aid just to deal with rent with my mom and then groceries and then food because my house doesn't like buying me food that I can eat which is again bullshit um yeah but here we are still living still kicking it's nice somewhat somewhat <laughs> but yeah um I'm trying to think I have one more thing to say but it just like into the wind <laughs> Do you have anything to say about the right to housing or building housing or squatting or? See, see, that's the thing. It's like people, like, like people, like they say housing is a like what's the word? Um, like a human right. It's a human right. Yes, it is a human right. But the government says it isn't. Exactly. It's like okay, so it's freezing cold outside. You might get frostbite. Where are you gonna go? Exactly. I, sometimes I hear shelters cost money. Sometimes they don't. I don't know. I'm not 100 percent sure on what that is because. But sometimes, like, you gotta pay to get in, and it's kind of bullshit, and it's like, bro, like, it's literally, like, negative a thousand or something. Yeah. I'm freezing, I'm gonna die, let me in, please. Like, and then they kick you out at 7 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. There's only... I, in Vancouver, I can't exactly remember what it was called, but they're shutting down, um... I think it's a youth like outreach house? yeah i think that's it i'm not 100 percent sure but i've seen it around instagram and they're shutting it down like because funding or something like the gov like like i understand like it's, it's a lot of work to do that stuff but like the government could fund it you have the money like you're just choosing not to because you're an ignorant piece of shit exactly 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 they still won't get it done exactly yeah, like volunteer, there's volunteers, people love to volunteer, I volunteer, um, you know, you can do that, but no, when you're volunteers, we can't do that, but yeah, <laughs> um, and like, like the deal with like, mental health is like, you know, they just put a blind eye to that too, like, if any, you know, if you're big in the mental health community or anything like that, you've heard of Pez, especially in Victoria. Pez is complete bullshit. I haven't, luckily, 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 I haven't gone there yet. Can you explain what Pez is? Pez is the mental health, like, like, it's for 17 and up. And it's like, basically, they, in my experience in different mental hospitals, they sit, lock you in a room, feed you three times a day. That's it. Sometimes you get to see a counselor, if you're lucky. I... I was, I was in BGH, I was admitted to BGH for mental health, for suicidal ideation. I am chronically suicidal, all the time. Um, I think five times now, I've had over ten attempts, 
and I've been admitted five out of those ten times. They lock me in a room, they feed me, I ask for food because like, like, like I, I need to eat. And sometimes they'll refuse, they'll refuse to feed me. The other day this guy, one of the nurses named Michael, he knows I suffer with um, derealization and dissociation and he was ranting about how I wasn't real and how I was on a mission from oh, a different dimension. God. He what? works there, he's getting paid to do this shit and I'm just sitting here like, dissociating, derealizing, and I'm like, fuck man, get me the fuck out of here. When I was there a couple, like, a couple years ago, I was crying every single day. Like, I fell asleep crying because I just wanted to go home because of how bullshit it was. I went to Ledger. I went to Ledger a couple months ago. If you don't know what Ledger is, Ledger is a long-term mental hospital. See, VGH and Pez is usually a week at most. Well, some, sometimes longer. It all depends on the person. But Ledger is like two months. I, w I couldn't do that. I, um... My aunt, who I was living with before I put it, got put in the group home, she said, my mental health is too much for me, her. And first off, she knew that when she was getting into it. She knew I'd suffered from complex trauma. She knew what, what my life has been like. She knew. And then, fuck, what was I gonna say? <laughs> um, Ledger House. Ledger House, right, thank right you. On. And she's a counselor. She's a, she's a school counselor. My mental health is too much for her. So they kicked me out. She said, you're not getting into Ledger soon enough. I'm kicking you out. She kicked me out, sent me to a group home. Two months later, into Ledger. I think it was a different reason. Anyways, um, Ledger was complete bullshit. They locked me in a room all times a day. Um, they fed me, luckily. And I was able to interact with people like 10% of the time. Not that m m often, though. Hmm. I saw the psychiatrist. I can't remember her name, but they, I saw her once a week. I saw them all once a week. Which is like, what? I'm here for two months. Like, I shouldn't even be here for two months. Like, I should see someone almost daily if I'm here. Luckily, I was able to convince them to let me do a day program, which they don't usually do. So I go, I wake up at like 7 a.m., I go there, and I leave at the end of the day and go back to my group home. That was too much. Like, every day on the, like, that road, I can't even do it with that road anymore. Like. I, my vision was blurry. I, I, my vision goes blurry when I dissociate. They thought it was like seizures. It's not seizures. It's just dissociation. Yes. But um, so I just sit there and I just be driving and driving. Like I don't drive. My worker would drive. But and I get out and I just stand there and I'll be like <sighs> long sigh and it'll be like fuck. Here we go again. Yeah. I got out of there luckily. Uh, one month in, I was like fuck this shit. Before that, it's a voluntary program, by the way, so you're there on your own free will. I asked them to leave multiple times, and they refused to let me leave. Like, like they, they had contact with my housing, and they were like, no, no, sorry, don't want to let you leave. You know, even though this is worsening your mental health, we're just going to keep you here. Um, at the beginning of uh, January, and we're hoping to be able to oust the conservative government, Doug Ford. And I can tell you from the depths of my soul that if, and I don't know at all if anybody over there follows, um, uh, like, the provincial, like, if you have the provincial politics from Ontario pop up on your feed, I wouldn't be able to blame you if you were like, no, and burn it like so a vampire because it really is all consuming once you ever start to look at it but the truth is is that when you see what happens like the, the trends they reflect themselves throughout the provinces and it's they, gross it's true they do yeah. yeah when you see what happens with the Ford government it's just crazy how he cut back on education and he cut back on housing and he cut mm -hmm. back on health care and this happens you like right throughout the country in canada we should not have a system which leaves behind people who are unhoused people exactly. who are disabled the indigenous our indigenous community people who don't have access are people who are ex-cons if you are an ex-con you are automatically discounted from any social service whatsoever and i feel as though we are blatantly Same. working hard to annihilate people from services one after the other it's not fair and we need to correct the system entirely. I feel as though financial autonomy would be the one way for sure to guarantee 
to guarantee that people would be able to stand up and live and, and, and complete the infrastructure of society. You know, if we had a real, honest to God, basic income, a basic income, which was an actual income, income being synonymous with the word wage, the one thing that we would for sure be able to do is we would for sure be able to fill out <clears throat> the bottom tax brackets, the bottom two tax brackets that we have. We have in Canada five tax brackets, 15%, 20.5%, 26%, 29%, and 33%. If we were to extend the top, the um, extend tax brackets, add another four tax brackets, say something along the lines of 35%, 36.5%, 38%, and 39%. Create these tax brackets for people who earn over $220,000 because that's, by the way, where it tops up. Now, I'm hmm. guessing that somebody who makes $220,000 is not the same kind of person who earns, say, I don't know, $3.5 million. If we were to top out our tax brackets to such a degree where we had <clears throat> people who were earning $220,000 to $800,000 paying 35% tax, people who were earning $800,000 to $3,500,000 to $3, paying 36.5% tax, people who were earning $3.5 million to $110,000 uh, million two hundred fifty thousand dollars paying thirty eight percent tax, okay. and people who are earning one hundred and ten million two hundred fifty thousand dollars plus um, paying thirty nine percent tax, we would be able to pay people who were zero dollar earners forty thousand five hundred dollars a year, no problem. Huh, awesome. It would be it would be a no brainer. It would be completely, completely, totally. No problem. But the thing which really bothers me the most is how easy it is for people to become a person with a disability. Exactly. COVID-19, yeah, for real. COVID-19, for example, the, the damage it does to people long term is unrealistic. For example, the JAMA Network published a study that indicated that people who uh, suffered from, like, survivors of COVID-19 had... Um, a 12.45% overall decline in cognition after suffering from it. That's for sure. So we have issues that we need to deal with. But I'm not the only person in the world who feels as though it's important to extend the tax brackets. You know, other people feel this way. Even people who are part of the 1% feel this way. And not only that, but poverty is, and of itself, a fundamental health crisis. You know? We cannot be um, people who care about what other people spend their money on. You know, it's important to recognize that if people have financial autonomy, they'll spend it how they want to spend it, and those things are always good things. Their homes, their health care, their, their lives, their exactly. groceries, everything. And I think it's important to recognize that now because the need is so much greater. So, yeah. we had this woman here, she was telling everybody that I was going to talk about um, uh, a woman here who uh, took maid as an alternative because she couldn't find um, affordable housing, and it's true. Uh, her name was, uh, she, she didn't volunteer her name, she, uh, the CTV spoke about her. They identified her as a warning Sophia. And um, it's true. She she ended up uh, opting for um, medically, uh, medical assistance and dying because she was unable um, she was unable to find real like affordable housing. And so she had something called multiple chemical uh, sensitivity. But if she had had access to a guaranteed or like to a basic income, um, she would have been able to afford herself, herself a place to live, which would have been of her own choosing. You know, 
I'm not beating my chest when I say that two doctors had signed off on a document and then performed the procedure, which cost a woman her life, and she could have been a perfectly thriving, functioning member of society. Mm -hmm. But because she was in endless pain and unable to breathe and constantly debilitated, she opted for the only mercy she could afford, a painless death. A woman who could have been a part of a structural, tax-paying infrastructure and enjoying a fruitful life with her family in a home which suited her medical condition versus a slow, painful decline and which ultimately ended her life at the hands of a government which essentially wouldn't recognize her value as a member of society. I'm going to go with Sophia and every single time. It's not because I'm a sentimentalist. It's because in reality, having Sophia and having people like Sophia uphold the structural integrity of society is fiscal conservatism. It's where we are. It's fiscally conservative yeah. to have basic income. Yeah. You got people giving you some uh, hand here. Yeah. Sorry, okay, questions, yes, of course. No, that, no people are clapping because of what you just said. Thank um, you, Patricia. And Brent, Brent is yelling thank you, and Tom is yelling thank you. And Good afternoon. Awesome. I want to keep mine fairly short, as this is about specifically housing and how that is a human right, which I also believe in. I believe basic income, while a separate broad subject and not a silver bullet, can have a reinforcing effect. Basic Income Canada Network and Coalition Canada defined this policy as a regular amount of money paid individually, not, per, not to the household, but to each person on a regular basis, subject only to current income and residency. <laughs> it is unconditional, creating a floor to keep people from falling into poverty should any kind of disaster strike. Living in BC over the last few years can speak to examples of this, such as not only the pandemic, but floods, the heat dome, and wildfires. Housing is very much a human right in basic income philosophy. Professor Guy Standing traces the idea back to the rights of subsistence enshrined in the 1217 Charter of the Forest along with the second sealing of a much more well-known document, the Magna Carta. Hmm. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia, the Charter set precedence for common steward stewardship of shared resources to this current day. But to quote philosopher and economist and longtime fellow advocate Carl Weidekrist, we now come between a person and the resources they need to survive, saying you can't have them unless you, you do as we say, which now unjustly, cruelly, and without any form of rationality criminalizes homelessness, which I see as a person's last stand on our enclosed commons. Meanwhile, we allow for every form of private inheritance, subsidies, and quantitative easing. It is from here that the argument for basic income can be seen as first ethical, because the work of any one of us is far more to do with the efforts and the invest with the efforts and investments of generations of those who have come before than anything we are, we, we, you and I do, in our, do ourselves. We don't know whose ancestors contributed what, so in this way basic income becomes an investment in our communities from the past, crucially needed now as we face rising insecurities, the downward pressures of technology, fragmenting work, and rising costs. On that, experiments all over the world, as well as the long-running Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, have shown the basic income not only can reduce inflationary pressure, but even to reduce costs by creating a solid customer base for producers while ra raising wages. Indeed, according to writer Scott Santons, when the Alaska checks are given out, you actually see a lot of sales in stores as businesses are trying to get customers. Exactly. <laughs> Specifically on housing, um, basic income has been seen to reduce stress, improve mental health and mental bandwidth, fostering the ability to think long term as opposed to how George Orwell said of poverty in his writings, that poverty eliminates the future. An example of this was a 2018 unconditional cash transfer program, the New Leaf Project, by Vancouver-based nonprofit Foundations for Social Change, working with UBC to give 50 homeless men $7,500 each. Far from spending it on impulse buys and what critics might suspect, every guy used the money on things like food, securing rents, clothing, transport, the whole thing saving the shelter system a total of $405,000 for the year. It creates a stronger and regularly appearing footing which can meet housing programs halfway, giving people the ability to not have to take the first thing that comes available. This power to choose. Okay. This power to choose, the power to say no to exploitation is one of the reasons it is a call for action 
4.5 in the report on murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, along with support from Food Banks Canada and the Canadian Association of Social Workers. <laughs> in terms You're of funding good. sources, there are many, like Patricia said. I'd like to say we can get the money from where it went, the rentier class, the owners of physical, financial, and intellectual property. A concrete example of this are the real estate investment trusts, or REITs, which I can count at least five from, from my place, which is now a REIT, <laughs> on Cook and Rockland to Beacon Hill Park. For me, basic income is about pushing back, giving a sense of stability, certainty, and security, which are critically needed as things change, giving people not a handout, but a hand up. Online, I go by Tom, the BI, BI Vic BC guy. I'll never stop believing a better world is possible. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic BC. Check out Basic Income BC, Basic Income Canada Youth Network, BI Works, and Basic Income Canada Network. Thank you for listening. Right on, man. Cheers. Right on. Yeah, so this, nice, so this uh, announcement and the information that I was just going to is more than just a warning. It's a call to watch your backs, to make sure that everybody's okay, to make sure that we're all vigilant in the face of the victory D and the street sweeps and the cops in general, the law enforcement, because we they have clearly shown that they're not on our side, and they were never on our side, and they were never supposed to be on our side. So let's just eliminate that illusion out of our heads that they were ever somehow supposed to be serving us in any way in any way I don't yeah exactly thank you you can put it down I'll do it for you thanks for that exactly I just wanted to close off by thanking everybody like seriously I mean I know it's hard sometimes to think the numbers aren't that high but for for the way it's been in Victoria this is pretty good with the threat of rain, a lot of people are sick. Like half of our anarchists are home sick with this uh, Omicron thing. They're going to be okay. They're young, but but a lot of them tested positive in the last couple of weeks. So, um, but I noticed that we had talked about uh, doing another housing rally on May 27. So one of the other things that developed that uh, Shay, I was going to talk to you about. I don't know if we we've had the chance yet, but we talked about for many years now. We've noticed a lot of people's mental health who are unhoused and people who are in shelters like the one Ida spoke about who are not getting proper sleep. Like a lot of people are leaving the shelters now because their complex PTSD is so triggered by, it's just, it's like there's not really the support needed and the community when it tries to come together seems to always get attacked so they end up going outside. A lot of people have chemical sensitivities like the woman in, in, in Toronto who chose made, chose to die with dignity in a country that could have been giving her the dignity to live <laughs> you know like why couldn't she get housing for someone who's like allergic to all the chemical shite that this system and society creates like some people can handle it because of strong immunities but a lot of people can't but I got housed because I had the same chemical sensitivity and I got into housing social housing when I was in a crisis I mean otherwise I might be in the same boat she's in and and right now she's, you know, she's not with us anymore because Canada does not support poor people. Um, so May 27th, so, yeah, one second, let me just finish the thought. So people asked for support, Shay, to have tents set up for the space to sleep so that uh, to reach out to Solid and other people and ask AVI and other people, harm reduction, the harm reduction outreach, indigenous harm reduction, um, and SOS outreach and ask them, do you want to help support the right to sleep tent action? So it would be a four hour tent set up uh, like that long one indigenous harm reduction maybe I have. We have staff working it to make sure everybody's safe and people have the right to sleep like brother over here and other people who need, they just want to sleep. And so we got their backs, we set it up here in Centennial and they just get to sleep, man. <laughs> You know, like, uh, and it's so needed. So how about instead of having a housing rally on May 27, we'll do the right to sleep rally here that day. And maybe SOS, yeah, right on, cool. So that's what we're going to do, May 27. Uh, we just worked it out. That's what I love about anarchists and people who are living in poverty. We, 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 we just got to work it out in the moment. And Eric has a reminder for us about something. Um, so the schedule was uh, updated, actually. Yeah. It, but, was, it was moved. 
because can you just uh, tell us the updated schedule for May 27 because it says here rally for housing yeah that's an old one that's an outdated one okay so we're going to do it though unless you have an updated schedule that you can show me can you grab it okay so so we got to work this out now to make sure we get the right date before everybody leaves um, and anybody who wants to grab some water and chips for the road for your buddies out there I need a calendar I just need a